Hey guys, I'm here to discuss another hair loss treatment today, and this one is called Redensil. Now, if you've watched my videos, then you know that hair loss treatments fall under two categories. The first category of treatments are anti-androgens, and these would include things like finasteride, dutasteride, and alpha tradiol. These work by going after the source of hair loss, which are androgens like dehydrotestosterone, DHT, which are eating away at the hair follicles on the scalp. The second category of hair loss treatments are hair growth stimulants. The most famous of these is minoxidil, but there are also other ones that work in different ways like stamoxanine and adenosine, and these work by promoting growth of the dermal papilla cells, which in turn lead to hair growth. As such, a good hair loss treatment program will often include therapy from both of these categories so you can stop hair loss at its source with an anti-androgen while also promoting the growth of existing and new hair with a hair growth stimulant. So for the past 30 years, minoxidil has been the undisputed king of hair growth stimulants. It's inconvenient, it's messy, it sucks having to use it for life to maintain your gains, but it is definitely the most powerful hair growth stimulant on the market, or is it? So here comes Redensil. Redensil is another treatment that falls under the hair growth st stimulant category. So what I want to do today is examine how it works. I want to review the studies. And lastly, I want to compare it to minoxidil to see which one is the overall better product. So let's get to the point and look at the compounds in Redensil. Now, Redensil, the active ingredient consists of two active compounds. They are polyphenols known as DHQG and EGCG2. And for those who don't know what, uh, uh, these, are, these are polyphenols which are patented by the company, but for those who don't know what polyphenols are, they're basically just chemicals which are found in plants, and a lot of them are very good for your health. Um, but what these uh, two polyphenols are theoretically meant to do is that they're meant to target the outer root sheath bulge stem cells, ORS, and the fibroblasts, which are located in the dermal papilla, which is the lowest most region of the hair follicle. Now, during the telogen phase, the stem cells are dormant, but during the antigen or growth phase, the stem cells become activated and they migrate along the ORS to the base of the follicle where they produce new hair shafts. So let's examine the two polyphenols individually. Now the first and less important one in my opinion is EGCG2. EGCG2 was tested for its ability to produce IL-8 and IL-8, what that is, that's a cytokine which is known to cause scalp irritation and scalp irritation is likely to cause hair loss in some individuals. Now cytokines, what they are, they're proteins that are released by the immune system and EGCG2 reduced uh, IL-8 um, releases by about 21%, which would suggest that it's a good anti-inflammatory. Now, there is nothing wrong with including an anti-inflammatory compound in your product, but it is important to note that inflammation is not the reason why most people lose hair. So on this fact alone, EGCG2 is not going to have anything more than a benign effect on most individuals using it. And even if you do happen to have inflammation on the scalp, it may be through causes unrelated to IL-8, such as if you have a fungal or bacterial infection, in which case you'd be better suited uh, with another treatment your dermatologist can recommend to you. Now, the much more important active ingredient, in my opinion, amongst the two in Redensil, is DHQG. And I say that because it was found in vitro that DHQG does improve the proliferation of the outer root sheath cells. Additionally, DHQG treatment had an effect on gene expression in a way that may be beneficial to hair loss, including the stimulation of BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. Apoptotic refers to cellular death, as well as the inhibition of BAX, which is a pro-apoptotic gene, suggesting a better survival rate of the proliferation of the cells, which are responsible for hair growth. So with the in vitro studies, at least, we saw that DHQG was able to stimulate production of the outer uh, root sheath cells as well as dermal papilla cells. And it did this by increasing the viability and survival of the dermal papilla cells by 12, 12 to 24% and increased the proliferation of the outer root sheath cells by 28 to 48% percent, and it did this by reducing cellular apoptosis through the inhibition of uh, pro-apoptotic gene pathways. Of course, this is just a, uh, an in vitro study, and what can be measured at the cellular level may not always result in good outcome data. So the next thing that was performed was an ex vivo study, which is a type of study where a sample of human tissue is taken directly from a human, and then it's studied separately from a human organism. So. Let's take a look at this ex vivo study. Let's see how they did it and let's see what they found. 
So the start, what they did is uh, the, they took the hair follicles and they were extracted. Uh, they took the hair follicles from two patients and they are extracted from the occipital region of the scalp in the patient suffering from angiogenic alopecia who were undergoing hair transplant sur uh, transplantation surgery. And this caused a little bit of skepticism on my part because the occipital region of the scalp, which is like this region right here, it's not really affected by DHT. And I understand why they use this region since we are talking about a hair transplant, uh, but it makes me wonder how the outcome of the study would have been different uh, and how it would have been affected had they included regions of the scalp that are adversely affected by DHT. So anyways, what they did is that they extracted the 30 follicles from these two donors. And with these 30 follicles, they divided them into three groups, including a redensal group, a minoxidil 1% group, and an untreated group. So looking at the results, the study was conducted over a period of 7 to 10 days, and it was found that hair follicles treated with redensil grew faster than hair follicles treated with minoxidil. So great. Now, specifically compared to untreated, the minoxidil group, uh, there was about a 25% increase after seven days of treatment, and then a 118% difference after 10 days of treatment. Now, with the redensil group, uh, when compared to untreated, there was a 75% increase after seven days, and then after 10 days, there was a whopping 214% increase. So this, again, is a very promising outcome for redensil, but still, we're talking about an in vitro and ex vivo study, and these are not really strong forms of evidence to draw a conclusion from, but fortunately, uh, this study also includes a clinical investigation. And what they wanted to achieve with this clinical investigation is see how a 3% solution of Rudencil, which is the commercially available uh, version, I believe, would work on men suffering from androgenic alopecia after three months of treatment. So, the study conducted including 26 men uh, ranging from Norwood levels 3 to 4. So that's already a pretty substantial uh, degree of hair loss. I think I was actually in Norwood 3 before my hair transplant. And the men ranged in ages from 18 to 70 years old and were of Caucasian and North African ethnicities. Now their ethnicity is not a terribly important detail, but being that androgenic alopecia affects different ethnic ethnicities at different rates, I think it was still a good variable to have. And so the study... It was divided into two groups with 14 volunteers using Redensil and the other 12 using placebo. Now, both groups applied the lotion and Redensil and placebo for a period of 84 days and were randomized and double blinded while under the supervision of a dermatologist, which is good because this is the best type of study you can have basically. So to measure the results, what they did is they used a photo trichogram and that is what you'll see at a hair transplant doctor's office where they'll examine how many hairs you have per square centimeter and they'll see how bad your hair loss is. So during the duration of this treatment, what the trichogram showed is that after three months of using 3% Redensil, the group using Redensil experienced a 9% increase and hairs in the antigen phase, and it decreased the percentage of hairs in the telogen phase by 17% when compared to placebo. And what this resulted in after 84 days was an average increase of about 10,000 new hairs in about 12 out of uh, 14 volunteers who responded to the treatment. So that suggests an efficacy of about 85%, I mean, at least in this study. So to give you an idea of how many hairs that is, the average human scalp has about uh, like 110,000 hairs on it. So 10,000 new hairs is enough for it to be noticeable. And indeed, 71% of the volunteers responded with satisfaction to the treatment. So that would suggest that uh, this treatment is very good. So what I wanted to do is further examine the quality of the study. So I took a look at the p-value of the study. And for those who don't know what the p-value is, it's basically a way to use math to determine whether a study is good or if the results were due more to chance. So after three months of the study, the p-value measured of the comparison of the groups was at 0.0005%. And that means that there's only a five in 10,000 chance that the results are due to luck. So that would in indicate that this is a very good study. So I was almost ready to end this and just go ahead and give the product my official endorsement. However, one thing that set me off was how in the ex vivo study, it was compared to 1% minoxidil, which isn't even commercially available unless you compound it yourself. The smallest concentration of minoxidil you can buy uh, commercially is 2% and 5% is widely and cheaply available in most countries. So I had to wonder why minoxidil was only used in the inferior ex vivo study and not in the clinical trial with 5% minoxidil instead of 1% minoxidil. So what I wanted to do was look at how redensil compared uh, to minoxidil. 
And fortunately, being that minoxidil is an FDA-approved treatment for hair loss, uh, there was no shortage of data on minoxidil, so it was very easy for me to find some good data. And surprisingly, what I did find uh, actually speaks more favorably of Redensil than minoxidil. Specifically, I wanted to look at the number of hair follicles per square centimeter, which were increased as a result of taking 5% minoxidil versus the numbers increased in the study on Redensil. Now, looking at the 5% minoxidil, there was an increase of 14.9 hairs per cubic uh, per square centimeter. Now, Redensil, on the other hand, uh, resulted in 17. Uh, uh, hairs per square centimeter, which would suggest that at least within the first three months, Redensil is at least as good as 5% minoxidil. So I would say that they're comparable at least, but I'm hesitant to say Redensil is better because there is no direct comparison of the two treatments in a study, which is an important detail because the controls in the two studies can be different. So we can't say for absolute certainty which is better, only that Redensil as of now at least has potential. So it was to my surprise, but it does look that Redensil at least works. And, you know, I still prefer and trust Minoxidil as my main hair growth stimulant more because, you know, it's FDA approved. There are many, many more studies, including safety studies. And, you know, this is important because if you want to know about a study's reliability, then you need to look at repeatability since follow-up studies on Redensil may not be as optimistic as this one study that I found. Now, in the case of Minoxidil, we know it's an FDA approved treatment. Uh, it's an FDA approved drug. So there are loads of studies backing up. It's validity and reliability as an effective hair loss treatment. So as good as the clinical trial on Redenosil is, it is still just one clinical trial. Um, also, I should mention that minoxidil has been around for a long time. It's been over 30 years, and uh, that is really a testament to its safety profile. You know, even though Redenosil is sourced from natural ingredients, that doesn't necessarily make it safe in the long term. I mean, let's let's face it, cyanide and ricin both come from natural sources too. So let's, uh, uh, let's not pretend that natural means safe. And also, it should be mentioned that minoxidil is quite a bit cheaper than Redensil, especially since minoxidil has been available as a generic for many years now. And you can easily buy a three-month supply for uh, 20 US dollars if you source it from the right place. Uh, Redensil, from what I've seen at least, is about three times more expensive than that. So... In conclusion, in the battle between the grizzled old veteran Minoxidil versus the Gen Z new kid on the block, Redensil, I still say that Minoxidil is the better choice, but you know that may change if more subsequent data and studies are released on Redensil, backing up this promising clinical trial that I found. And you know, I probably won't ever use Redensil because you know what I'm using currently works well for me, and I doubt any adding anything else to my stack, especially another topical, will be convenient or effective at this point. And uh, however. I got to say, though, I do appreciate that Redensil is backed by strong research, even if it isn't a tremendous quantity of research, which is understandable since it is a much newer product than Minoxidil. And I also appreciate that Redensil is vegan, unlike the absolute garbage, which is Viviscal and Nutrafol, which for no good reason put sea creatures, including sharks, which are endangered in their products. So I guess there isn't much more I can say beyond that about Redensil, but it does seem like a pretty good product. If anyone who has tried it wants to share their experience, be it a positive or negative experience, you know, I'd love to hear it. So uh, in the meanwhile, you know, I'll be back with more content soon. Have a good weekend.